Hello and welcome to the Hubblecast. Scientists reckon that most of the matter in the universe is something called dark matter, an unknown type of matter that neither emits nor reflects light. But does dark matter really exist? Can scientists prove it? The NASA ESA Hubble Space Telescope is helping to answer this question. In 2004, an international team of astronomers pointed Hubble towards the constellation of Pisces, the fish, to observe a galaxy cluster that goes by the telephone number of CL0024 plus 17 and which is located 5 billion light years away from Earth. Now, Hubble's advanced camera for surveys produced a stunning image of this cluster. The galaxies in the cluster are seen here in yellow. Analyzing the image over the last couple of years, the team discovered a ring of dark matter, seen here in blue, and realized that the position of this ring did not match at all the position of the hot gas and the galaxies in the cluster. The ring itself is 2.6 million light years across. Now this is the first time that dark matter has been found with a distribution that is so radically different from the distribution of the ordinary matter. This remarkable finding is attributed to the collision of the cluster with another cluster between one and two billion years ago. The team's computer simulations show, here seen from the side, that when the two clusters smashed together, the dark matter fell to the center of the combined cluster and bounced back out. In reality, the collision occurred along our line of sight, so that we have a head-on view of it. From this perspective, the dark matter structure looks like a ring, just as the new analysis shows. So how did astronomers spot this ring of dark matter? Well, tracing dark matter is not an easy task. The reason is, of course, that dark matter does not emit or reflect any light. The most direct way of detecting its influence is to study the way its gravity deflects light. Now to do this, astronomers study the faint light from galaxies that lie behind the cluster and whose light gets distorted and smeared into arcs and streaks by the gravity of the dark matter in the foreground cluster. Now this powerful trick is called gravitational lensing. To illustrate this, imagine that I am a background galaxy being lensed by a massive foreground cluster. So by mapping the distorted light, astronomers can deduce the mass of the cluster and they can trace the distribution of the dark matter within the cluster. This amazing image shows us some spectacular examples of faint background galaxies that have had their light bent by the cluster's strong gravitational field. One of them, located about two times further away than the yellow cluster galaxies in the foreground, has been multiply imaged into five separate arc-shaped components. Hubble's high resolution can even show the details within this background galaxy. The ring's discovery is among the strongest evidence that dark matter actually exists, and it increases confidence in our current theory of gravity. This is Dr. J signing off for the Hubblecast. Once again, nature surprises us beyond our wildest imagination. Have you ever wondered why some telescopes are launched into space while others are built on remote mountaintops? What is actually the best for astronomy? Here we provide a ringside view of the fight for the elusive photons from deep space. Is it a battle of the telescope giants? Welcome to the Hubblecast. Now when I was a kid, I often used to stare at the night sky and wonder what it was all about. Now back then, I usually only used my eyes or at most a pair of binoculars. But astronomers have telescopes that are much more powerful than the naked eye and which can be used to uncover the faintest and most distant objects in the universe. Now in today's Hubblecast, we will take a small detour from our usual flow of amazing discoveries and images from the NASA ESA Hubble Space Telescope and look at the most fundamental tool used by astronomers, the telescope. Now it all began nearly 400 years ago when Galileo Galilei 
for the first time, looked at the universe through a small telescope. Now, this momentous occasion will actually be celebrated in 2009, which has been declared the International Year of Astronomy. Today, we have telescopes of many different sizes and shapes. Some are on the ground, like ESO's very large telescope, located on a remote 2,600 meter high mountain in the Atacama Desert in Chile. It's seen here in one of the most sophisticated computer models ever made. Some telescopes are in space, like the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit around Earth almost 600 kilometers further up. So how does a telescope work? Well, common to almost all telescopes, regardless of size or purpose, is that they have a mirror, some instruments, and a few supporting systems. Now the main function of the mirror is to collect as much light as possible from distant stars and galaxies. It is not to magnify anything as many people think. Then there are a number of secondary mirrors that send the light to the instruments. Now there are two main types of instruments. First there are cameras which essentially do what any normal digital camera does, they take images. And then there are the spectrographs that spread the incoming light into its constituent colors like a rainbow, which can tell a lot about the physics of distant objects. Ingenious engineers and imaginative astronomers around the world compete in a scientific battle of how to unveil the secrets of the universe. So who is winning? Are the ground-based telescopes better because they are larger and collect more light from faint stars and galaxies? Or are the space-based telescopes winning the race as they can make sharper images above the clouds and the disturbing atmosphere. On that count, ground-based astronomy is fast catching up. Advanced techniques, such as adaptive optics, have been developed to correct for the atmospheric blurring and twinkling. On the other hand, the atmosphere blocks certain wavelengths of light. Only space telescopes, like Hubble, that fly above the atmosphere, can access the ultraviolet and infrared parts of the spectrum, which are invisible from the ground. Ground-based telescopes, on the other hand, can observe larger portions of the sky in one go and also usually have more specialized instruments that are easier to change when new techniques are developed. It would, of course, make for a much more exciting Hubblecast episode if we could show you a bloody battle between furious ground-based and space-based astronomers. But in reality, there is no battle between ground-based and space-based telescopes. Observing teams often use combinations of different telescopes on the ground and in space to solve the riddles of the universe. So the bottom line is, it's not a competition. It's the synergy and complementarity between the different kinds of telescopes that matter, whether they're small or large, in the southern or northern hemisphere, on the ground or in space. What matters is that they're all working towards a common cause, discovering the secrets of the world around us. This is Dr. J signing off for the Hubblecast, which, by the way, from today onwards will be available in high definition from spacetelescope.org.